James G. Rickards is editor of Strategic Intelligence, Project Prophesy, Crash Speculator and Gold Speculator. He is an American lawyer, economist, and investment banker with 40 years of experience in capital markets on Wall Street. He was the lead negotiator for the bailout of Long-Term Capital Management LP, LTCM, by the U.S. Federal Reserve in 1998. Its clients include institutional investors and government offices. His work is featured regularly in the Financial Times, Evening Standard, The New York Times, The Telegraph and The Washington Post, and is frequently featured on BBC, RTE Irish National Radio, CNN, NPR, C-SPAN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox, and The Wall Street Journal. Listen to the full podcast to understand global liquidity crisis, and are we on the verge of global economic crisis? Please follow us on YouTube and open your notifications for further podcasts. Enjoy. So getting back to the point about this, you know, Russia, uh, China teaming up, I mean, or, or, or other countries now looking outside of the U.S., uh, we already see it with Saudi Arabia in discussions uh, to start using the Chinese yuan. Um, you know, what, what, what's the next step? You know, let's talk about does this fast track the digitalization of, of coins coming down the, the road here, Jim? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I point out that the dollar has been a cryptocurrency since at least 1979. That was the, that was the last year the Treasury issued a paper Treasury note, like you had a note. Maybe somebody's grandmother has still has an old one in the attic, but they had little, uh, almost like uh, you know, stamps, like you peel off a coupon and take it down to the bank and get paid. That, that the last time they did that was about was 1979. So the dollar has been digital and message traffic has been encrypted since uh, since around 1980. Um, but I think in terms of the impact on the dollar, this is, a, this is you know, be careful what you wish for. And this was a, exactly what I was saying earlier in terms of second and third order effects. And I, I warned the Pentagon about this and I warned the Treasury about this because I know how economic sanctions work. I've been very involved in that from the point of view of the intelligence community and also advising the government. But they can be powerful. But if you use them too much and too broadly, they actually lose all their... Uh, their impact because the, the the people you're targeting say, well, okay, no mas, I'm out of the dollar system. You've you've done it one too many times, and, and this is an example of that we've never frozen a central bank before. We have now. We've never fro- kicked an entire country out of SWIFT, with the exception of Iran, but that's a much more isolated case. We have now with Russia, um, and so instead of just sitting there saying, oh gee, you got me, we can say, okay, let's go to a new payment system. Let's pick up a new currency. The Saudis are saying the same thing, and all of a sudden, if you're if you're, you know, one of the top princes of Saudi Arabia, you know, maybe uh, Mohammed bin uh, Salman, or, uh, or or any of the top princes, you know, you have a yacht in Monaco, you have a house in Aspen, uh, you have a um, you know who knows how many houses and palaces and yachts around the world, private jets, and they're like, hey, well, hey, actually, all that stuff could be seized, because that's what we're doing to the Russian oligarchs. And by the way, um, it's not limited to oligarchs. We saw this kind of neo-fascism in Canada very recently with Christia Friedland, who's the deputy prime minister, freezing the bank accounts and the crypto wallets of the truckers. Now, these are blue-collar, nonviolent protesters. Yeah, they were blocking traffic. Or anyone who supported the truckers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry? Or anyone who supported the truckers. Anyone who supp- Well, actually, Canada went so far as to criminalize it. If you supported the truckers under they, under a recent interpretation of uh, Canadian law through uh, Christy Freeland, the, the deputy prime minister, that's a criminal act. Um, so I, I told I told Justin, I said, come and get me. But, uh, but, but my point being, so she's uh, seizing the accounts of blue collar truck drivers and Biden's seizing the accounts of oligarchs, but it's the same thing, okay? Blue collar, you know, multi-billionaire. But it's the same thing. Suddenly, Canada and the U.S., two of the you know, the number one, I think number five economy in the world, number six maybe, um, have frozen Canadian dollar and U.S. dollar accounts of people they don't like. Now, you can say it's for good reason and Putin should have invaded Ukraine. I get it. But um, if you're a Saudi prince, um, if you're um, certainly a Russian, if you're a Chinese oligarch, how comfortable are you with the dollar right now? I'm going to suggest yeah. the answer is not very. And this is why um, so many investors out there are, are now scrambling, perhaps, um, to look for alternatives outside of their, you know, current Canadian or U.S. Um, uh, banking system. But back to the point, and I had asked this to another expert 
and, and help me help me understand this. The U.S. must have uh, administration must have understood the repercussions of this. So why would they do anything that would risk the U.S. dollar losing its reserve currency status? Because they didn't understand it. Now you would think they would. You would think, but there's the number two guy at the Treasury, uh, it's Wally something. He's he's the sanctions guy. He's he's on point. I don't know if he's a deputy secretary of the Treasury, but he's a senior official in the Treasury, and he's on point for the sanctions. Um, I haven't met him personally, by the way. I checked him out. Looks like a thoroughly bright guy. But other than carrying Larry Fink's briefcase for a few months, I mean, he, he's a year maybe, he's never had a job outside of academia or government. So he doesn't really understand the real world and doesn't understand what we're discussing right now. So the answer to the question, Danielle, is that they, they didn't think this through. They don't understand these, these knock-on effects. They don't understand how the international monetary system actually works. They don't understand the blowback. I mean, I'll give you another example. This one has been received some publicity. So, so we throw all kinds of sanctions on Russia. So Russia said, okay, we're going to stop export, our exports, Russian exports of strategic metals and you know, chemicals and other, other elements that everyone else needs for inputs in their manufacturing processes. And they put a ban on exports of nickel. Well, uh, okay, so you need nickel to make batteries, so good luck with your electric yep. vehicles. Uh, but, uh, okay, so U.S. throws sanctions on Russia. Russia retaliates by banning nickel exports. The price of nickel goes to the moon. It went up by a factor of four or five. That's really not surprising. London Metal Exchange fell down. They had to Altered. close. Yep. Okay, but who lost? There was a, a Chinese billionaire who owns the largest, one of the largest nickel uh, uh, mining operations in the world who lost, um, I think, uh, five or six billion dollars. So here's, here's Russia and the U.S. fighting an economic war, and the loser pops up in China. That wasn't yeah. on his radar screen, and that wasn't on anybody else's radar screen, but it's a good example where the, the damage shows up in, when you don't expect it. And, you know, you, you brought up... Um chapters one and two from, from Currency Wars, where you, you basically highlight uh, this scenario. Um, you said the scenario you presented at the time was that Russia and China would accumulate large gold reserves, pool their gold, and launch a new digital currency backed by gold in the place of the U.S. dollar. Is that the form it would take for you, something backed by gold? Probably, and here's why. Uh, and, and by the way, when I, when I wrote that, when we did the war game, and when I wrote that, Russia had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have 2,300 tons. China had about 600 tons of gold, and today they have about 2,000 tons, just slightly less, that we know of. And they may have several thousand tons off the books in the State Administration of Foreign Exchange that we don't know about because that's, the, that's completely opaque. So Russia and China did exactly what we warned the Pentagon about in 2009, exactly, which is increase their gold reserves by a factor of four or more. Um, so, but, uh, everyone's like, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the global reserve currency. No, and it's not going to be the group, but, but, but here's why. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons, but the main reason is when you talk about reserve currency, you have to understand what that means. It's not like the People's Bank of China has a bunch of hundred dollar bills on pallets stacked up in the basement. When people say reserve currency, what they really mean is the currency of the bonds that they invest in. In other words, they're dollar-denominated assets in the form of treasury bonds or notes. That's what China actually has on their books, um, not like dollars per se. So if you want to suggest or hypothesize that the Chinese yuan is going to replace the U.S. dollar as a global reserve currency, where's the yuan bond market? I mean, it doesn't exist. Uh, very small scale, very liquid, no primary dealers, no when issue trading, no auctions. Um, no repo, none of the sell no settlement clearance, none of the uh, the plumbing and the mechanics of uh, of a mature bond market such as the uh, the United States. Uh, and above all, they don't have a rule of law. I mean, at least if you you know somebody eggs on treasury bond, you can sue somebody, but you can't do that in China. So the absence of the rule of law, number one, the absence of the infrastructure, the plumbing, for want of a better word, are two reasons why the yuan and and certainly the rupee will not replace the dollar as a reserve currency. However, what I was hypothesizing then, and I would I'd come back to this, is you can create a brand new currency that does have all that stuff. And in my example, they, they used a Swiss bank, um, UK law, uh, put the gold in a third party depository. If you wanted some of the new currency, you could 
deposit your own gold and get some of the currency or trade with them and run a surplus. So it was a, it was a replacement system, but it, but you, you would need the gold to, to instill confidence. Um, but uh, they don't, they, again, they don't have bond markets, so they're not going to have them soon. So those, the yuan and the ruble aren't going to replace anything. I guess to wrap part one of this very thorough discussion, I want to get back to really uh, the main point you're hammering home here is that we're on the verge of a global liquidity crisis. Um, how does that domino effect play out? How, how far are we from this really erupting to that global crisis, Jen? Does it, does it happen exponentially from here? Does it take a few years? Where are we at? Um, it's it's more the uh, more the former. We are uncomfortably close now. It's impossible to know exactly how close because it's a complex dynamic system, and you can you can make uh, very good predictions on complex dynamic systems as to the magnitude of the crisis. Um, but it's very hard to get the exact timing. But I because you never know what you know thing is going to trigger it. But I can say that. We're, we're uncomfortable because now we've been there twice before in recent years. 1998, we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. Uh, that was the long, that was the, began with a Russian default, by the way, August 17th, 1998, Russia defaulted on um, their external debt and the ruble was grossly devalued. That started a global liquidity crisis, went around the world, ended up in my lap at, at long-term capital management. Um, where we had $1.4 trillion of derivatives. And everyone goes, oh, you know, long-term capital, you guys lost a lot of money in Russia. We didn't. We lost eh, maybe $100 million in Russia, but we lost closer to $4 billion on everything else because in a liquidity crisis, people sell everything. It's not a question of, oh, do you have Russian bonds? It's like, no, they sell everything, spreads widen, uh, not enough collateral, margin calls, people being blown out of their positions. That's what a global financial crisis looks like. We cured that with a $4 billion all-cash injection sponsored by the Federal Reserve and, and two, two rate cuts, one on an emergency basis by Alan Greenspan. We got through that, but we came within hours of shutting every market in the world. Same thing in 2008. We all know, you know, September 15, 2008, Lehman Brothers, okay. People don't realize um, that, you know, Morgan Stanley was days away from failing. Goldman Sachs was days away from failing. Um, you know, John Mack said so at the time. He, he, you know, Lehman was begging for help. He said, sorry, I got my, I got enough on my plate. We're worried about Morgan Stanley right now. Um, you know, and then the Fed came in. And so think of it as dominoes are falling. So all the dominoes are falling and they're going to keep falling unless you truncate it, drop a wall in. And that wall was the Fed. But here's my point. Each bailout gets bigger than the one before. Each crisis is more dangerous than the one before. So 1998, 2008, here we are in 2022. We're going to get to a point, we may be there, where the crisis is actually bigger than the Fed, bigger than the Fed's ability to stop. And I guess, finally, to just bring this home, um, you know, given the terrifying picture you've just painted, Jim, um, how should we be protecting ourselves here? Well, uh, you want assets that are going to be immune from a global liquidity crisis. What are they? Uh, land, real estate, gold, silver, you know, fine art. Uh, you know, I see Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe has gone, they estimate $200 million. You could have bought that for $50,000 in the, in the 1970s. Uh, that's, that's a little more specialized. But there are, you know, natural resources, uh, water, you know, et cetera. Uh, energy, oil. Uh, if you want to be in stocks, okay, get stocks of companies that are based on natural resources, um, you know, such as ExxonMobil, Chevron. I mean, I'm not. Uh, I'm just giving these as an example, but um, so there are there are a lot of ways to protect yourself. But uh, um, you know, a regular stock portfolio um, is not a good one, and you know, banks are going to be in, in distress. Money market funds are going to be in distress. That's what a liquidity crisis is. Jim Rickards, thank you so much for your thoughts on, on, on Russia, Ukraine, and the repercussions uh, that we will uh, want, unfortunately have to, to, uh, to suffer. Um, so thank you for your thoughts. Thanks.